How's it going, guys? It's Nate. I'm back with another reaction. Today, I am reacting to Jordan Peterson and Chloe Valdari, the whiteness in American culture. Now, this is a podcast I listened to. I was actually on my way back home from Florida, from South Sudan, uh, and and I listened to this podcast, and I was just like, it was one of those that just hit so hard, um, made some amazing points, and made me really look inward and really think about my stance and think about the way I'm thinking. And and something she said in the interview uh, towards the end was was talking about uh, relating to other individuals or other people and other people's stances and not villainizing or or wanting revenge on somebody for their stance um, and it's something that really hit home for me because I had been attacked personally attacked uh, by and not physically but uh, by a person with an opposite stance of me um, I hadn't said anything volatile I hadn't said anything cruel or out of out of proportion i was trying to have a conversation and this person violent like the names she called me and the things she said were very hurtful and so i had taken a stance in my mind kind of unknowingly of like almost hatred toward her and um and so something chloe had said in this interview really struck home with me about uh uh the hate we have for another person being a check on on ourselves on on what's in on on what's the inward part of ourselves so i would highly suggest besides watching this go check out this full interview because it really was really good and i like her stance and it's not that i agree with everything that she stands for or agree with everything jordan stands for you know but it's it's about having conversation and and being as jordan says anytime you have a conversation with someone Go into it with the knowledge that they know something that you don't. And I think that's a powerful thing. And so, uh, yeah, I'd highly suggest going and looking at this interview. As it is, I'm excited to get into this, break down my thoughts, and 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 just and just see what they're talking about and how they cut this video up from the interview. Something that I'm pulling out of the Atlantic article that was written about you, okay? okay. So this will be a more productive way of approaching this, I think. So. Sure. Ibram Kendi is is quoted here mm. before and after the Civil War before and after civil rights before and after the first black presidency the white consciousness duels the white body defines the American body the white body segregates the black body from the American body the white body instructs the black body to assimilate into the American body the white body instructs the black uh, sorry the white body rejects the black body assimilating into the American body and history and consciousness duel anew the black body in turn experiences the same duel. The black body is instructed to become the American body. The American body is the white body. It's like, hey, I read that and I thought, ah, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're, you, you, the guy is eloquent, that's it. Um, also, I've been following Chloe on like social media and her post and she went on Bill Mayer and, and I've just followed her cause, because I love her perspective. Cause, okay, when I first stepped into the atmosphere of like thought and political thought and and psychological thought and philosophical thought i i didn't know anybody i didn't know anything i was just stepping in afresh i was raised very strict conservative like and i'm not saying conservative politically um actually politics was never a conversation whatsoever so i was i was ignorant completely ignorant so i just stepped in and with a fresh mind and i stepped in and immediately started hearing well first thing I heard extreme left ideals and part of my personality and part of who I am wanted to just adhere to that because I care for people so much and what they were telling me were people were oppressed um, different groups were oppressed and that I was an oppressor and so I immediately was like oh no uh, I mean oh no <laughs> and then um, eventually I started hearing a lot of right wing thinkers or or even middle of the road thinkers but I really wanted to hear some good thought from the left and I searched I searched 
and I couldn't find anyone labeled left who had any good thoughts. Um, now, since then, I found a couple, but they're hard to find. And Chloe, I would say, is one that I, I, I don't know if she labels herself middle of the road. Um, Personality-wise and, and heart-wise, she's definitely left thinking. She's more open, conscientiousness. But uh, she's coming in, and she's uh, she's uh, unique in her perspective, and I appreciate it very much. Not exactly. Like, I get it. I get yeah. it. So it is the I, case. My, that... my take was way worse than that response. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I want to hear it right away. Well, here's where I think the mistake is being made, and it's a fundamental mistake. It's like... It isn't obvious to me as a Canadian, say, looking at the United States, that a huge chunk of the American body hasn't been, like, remarkably defined by black culture. That line is so powerful. A large part of American culture is defined by black culture. And if not defined, very much impacted it's, it's precisely it's, the point. it's unbelievable i mean and it is especially in the arts and and yeah and mm -hmm. that's 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 a statement of admiration not of denigration yeah. it's yeah. like there there isn't anything in some sense that's more more closely aligned than the com in the combination of beauty and truth than the arts and to, exactly. to look at black domination in some sense or at least massive influence and, in an endless array of cultural spheres, especially musically. And God, where would life be without music? Indeed. Be unbearable without music. Yeah. And so this black genius, and you see it manifest itself in ways that just compel imitation. Yeah. They compel this tremendous it's imitation, quiet. which is real admiration, right? That's yeah. real admiration. Is, And it's continually imitated. They think of the effect of black music on every genre you can think of virtually. And so yeah. what, what is that sort of statement? Part of that statement is, well, look, cultures are set up to benefit the dominant group. And it has to be that way to some degree because there is this problem of uniting the many into one, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. But to, to make a blanket statement like that, it's like, it, it isn't obvious to me that the American body is so pure white. It's not obvious yeah. to me at all. Well, well, part of my issue with Ibram Kindi is not simply his mischaracterization of the impact that white people have had on our country, but by extension, his mischaracterization of the impact that black people have had on this country. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Albert Murray. He wrote an incredible book, uh, which is actually a collection of his writings um, called The Omni-Americans. And the subtitle is Alternatives to the Folklore of White Supremacy. And there's an incredible uh, parallel between what he writes about the African-American ethos, or what he calls the African-American idiom as expressed in music and Jungian's ideas about the hero's journey. He argues that the idiomatic expression as musically expressed in things like the blues and jazz and swing and hip hop. This is not simply a literal thing. It is a metaphorical expression of this capacity to play with whatever life gives you, including mm -hmm. the right. negative potential mm -hmm. and positive potential. This capacity to play is what affords a kind of elegance that emerges out of the base muck of life, right? And he calls it impromptu heroism culture, right? Which sounds mm -hmm. very similar to the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And that capacity to play is precisely what has been admired uh, from uh, the wider American culture and which has allowed Black American culture to pervade American culture and turn it into this composite. And so the problem that and I have- A much more embodied composite too. So it is in some uh, sense of- yes, to it's go uh, back to Descartes. Yes. Mm -hmm, you bet, it's you bet. It's a, it's it's a, it's a medication. It's yes. a, and, and it works so well because it's not, pro, it's not exactly propositionalized. It gets it's underneath the propositions. So, so you have said in Maps of Meaning that it is action, right? That presupposes ideas. And John Verveke has said that you know, we've been caught up 
part of the problem that we're dealing with in the West is this, this false understanding of meaning as derived from propositions, when it is in fact participatory ways of knowing that give rise to propositions in the first place. And so African-American culture, Black culture is a very embodied, participatory, relational experience, especially as expressed in the arts. And this is what is admired in the wider American zeitgeist. And so Ibram Kendi has been, I would say that he, he has been filled with far too much despair. Uh, and he is actually underestimating the power of Black culture. Ah, that line, um, her perspective, Abram Kendi has been, he, he, his, his viewpoint is despair. I would say that a lot, and I don't know who Abram Kendi is, a lot of people have this despair mindset. And those are the people that are being honest and to a certain extent being honest and care and really are like, in a, in a place of despair. And those are the people that need hope. Those are the people that need the truth shed, the light shed. Um, and then there's these people that enjoy the division, benefit out of the division, and so push these narratives of you have no impact on white culture and white culture is keeping you down. You're oppressed, you're a victim. Because people are benefiting from that. And so she says, underestimates the impact that black culture has had on American culture. That is so huge. This whole narrative of you are oppressed, you've been oppressed, that's the black story in America, is such a lie. And, and it, it does a disservice to the impact that black culture, black people have had on America as a whole not only in the arts the arts the arts is a great example of the impact um honestly growing up i really wasn't taught to to really pay attention to the color of people's skin at all i really like didn't really have a concept of it some of my greatest heroes growing up uh booker t washington george washington carver these these people that i idolized and i read these books of their stories and and, and was just inspired and loved them um, and their impact on our culture. Um, and so that's the reality of American culture and, and black culture's impact in American culture. And so this oppressive slash victim mindset or narrative actually does a disservice, a great disservice to that reality. It's fair. Uh, and he is actually under and I'll say her saying that he despairs is is uh, is a kind way to say it um, is is forgiving because um, honestly I think a lot of these people are malicious in their intent and benefit off of the division benefit off of uh, um, pe people believing they're oppressed um, and so maybe Abram Kendi is in a position of despair and is in a position of belief that this is the reality. But I tend to believe a lot of these people, especially the eloquent writers, the the journalists, the, the elite, these people benefit off of this narrative. And so she's, she's kind in saying that he despairs. But I would, I would, I would wager that he he is not in despair at all. I don't know him, so maybe I'm wrong. Has been filled with far too much despair. Uh, and he is actually underestimating the power of black culture mm -hmm. in his book, all throughout his book, among other things. But that is um, incredible because, you know, he comes with this desire to end racial injustice, but doesn't see that he has actually a blind spot which mischaracterizes America, the American experience, and fundamentally uh, depicts the black experience exclusively as degradation, which is precisely what white supremacists do. I don't think you can be such an eloquent writer and write an entire book, do all that study, all that research, 
and still be ignorant of the reality of this. If you are, you are highly delusional. Um, so either, number one, you're delusional, you're ignorant, or you're malicious and, uh, and in it for your own gain. Which is, I mean, a lot of these people are wanting to gain fame off of this subject or off of holding these stances. And, and in the short term, that, that's going to be a reality. We see it. Um, a lot of the elite, a lot of people bow to these ideas that are false, these lies, to gain fame or gain, basically it's virtue. They're, they're like, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a good person because I stand with the oppressed. That's the thought. And then there's people that really care and really are ignorant that haven't done research. And I think there's a, there's a thing of not doing research, but holding a strong stance. There's obviously something wrong with that. <laughs> but I think we all do it to a certain extent. But I would argue that most, the majority of people who have done this much research, written books and articles and are the loudest are actually in it for their own gain. Exclusively is degradation, which is precisely what white supremacists do. Mm, and that's the irony point. in all of this. And that's right. the tragedy in all of this. Tragedy. Why term it the theory of enchantment? Mm. You're her, her, I, I'm not her, sure how to characterize what she's doing, whether it's a company or uh, a, a movement, kind of what she's doing, this theory of enchantment look into it look her up what she's doing is awesome and and i i uh and i only know it from this interview so go look into it for yourself but uh it seems to be somewhat countering the effects of the die and or dei in canada and um and these ideologies behind the dei or the die the diversity inclusivity whatever um those ideas are dangerous and so this her 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 thing counter or counters what counters the negative effects of of these ideologies you're careful with your words you obviously thought about that for a long time and and yes so so yeah i mean this it's interesting because i feel like the term enchantment came to me almost in passing i was trying to figure out how to and we don't have to get into the details of this. I'm happy to get into it if you'd like, but I was trying to teach people or figure out a framework that could teach people how to love each other in the agopic sense of the word. And then I began to ask myself, well, what are people already in love with? And so I ventured into pop culture because pop culture shows us what people are already in love with. Mm, right, and, I, right. and I started to study aspects of our popular culture, which included things like Disney films and Nike and Beyonce and all of these brands that have quasi religious, actually not quasi religious like devotion from their fans. And I was just what, like, why, what, what is happening mm -hmm. there? That's so interesting because it means that you, you, this is one of the problems I have with the rationalist atheist types. Like it's a major problem. It's like, forget about the ontological claims of religion. I, I, that, that, that isn't the issue in some sense, as far as I'm concerned. And this touches on your discussion of Descartes. It's like people obviously, obviously have the capacity for religious experience. We have the capacity for awe. And you could say, well, awe isn't a religious experience. Well, that's a matter of definition and we could play that game, yeah. but but if it, the awe is deep enough, and it's a definitional issue, is, is mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, deep awe is religious, or, or we need mm -hmm. another word that means the same as religious if right. we're gonna talk about yeah. it. And right. You participate, that, participate in that in dance and in music and in these popular stories, which is why. This is one reason I love Jordan Peterson, is he brings fact into the reality of what like spiritual life is and this is my perspective I'm a, I'm a Christian and I take what he says which is just logical fact and and connect it to this spiritual realities which um, I think a lot of like church and and different uh, organizations and stuff 
they over spiritualize things and so it's hard to like practically uh connect things to real life sometimes and so him saying stuff like great awe is religion that's i love it it's it's logically correct awe and worship are connected and so worship when you worship something that is your god or the highest thing on your hierarchy of values whatever you value the most is your god and what you value the most you awe you tend to awe or worship and so these are just natural logical progression of thought and so connecting it to the reality of okay god or religion as we immediately characterize religion um it's like yeah that makes complete sense participate in that in dance and in music and in and even the connection to dance and music and art and how those are again connected to worship or or religion they're they're vocalized or acted out religion you participate that participate in that in dance and in music and in these popular stories which is why i've been so interested mm -hmm. in taking apart disney films for example mm -hmm. and they're very expensive productions they're very labor intensive the people of genius work on them they have huge cultural impact and yeah. and they're extraordinarily popular it's like what's going on here uh, exactly and so it's definitely worth an analysis and and i think you're wise to to start with, well, what is it that people are valuing and, and why? It, it's, it's an empirical observation in some sense. Mm -hmm. This is where they're deriving meaning and value. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the deep study of that is a religious study. And, and, and well, there's just, just no escaping that. So, yeah. okay. So yeah. you're looking at pop so, culture. So I'm looking at pop culture and I'm studying Disney and Beyonce and Apple and Nike and all of these brands. And I'm looking for a common theme to see if there's a common pattern across all of these. And the common pattern I'm seeing is that all these brands are creating content where their audience sees themselves, their, their imperfect selves, and their potential reflected in the content, which is why they gravitate toward it. And so I'm seeing, you know, in these, these Disney films that are motifs for the human condition. That's the bottom line of story, right? You see imperfection turned to potential. And that's a that's a complete story arc. So that's what she's saying she's seeing in these companies and in pop culture and ethos in these stories. And that's absolutely true. Any good mark a good marketing strategy will consist of a story. And so I'm seeing, you know, in these, these Disney films that are motifs for the human condition where this mm -hmm. imperfect, flawed, would-be hero has to go through a series of ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs to discover their potential self and emerge the hero. I'm seeing, you know, almost every Nike ad being this, this narrative for this, um, you know, sort of J uh, junior varsity athlete trying to become better and better and better at her craft and then emerge uh, in a spirit of excellence. I'm seeing Beyonce say things like who run the world girls and women gravitating towards that because they see their potential reflected in those lyrics. Mm. And it's a universal, it's a universal ideal that compels us to imitate. And that's what attracts our attention. And that pattern to identify that pattern is to look for what is truly religious. Because the pattern yeah. that underlies all of the pattern that underlies everything that compels us is the religious pattern. Mm. And it's the religious yeah, the instinct ideal. that orients us towards that. And that is not an ontological claim about the structure of reality. I'm not right. saying anything about God. This is this right. is a different kind of conversation. It is. Right. Um, it's on the it's on a logical level, and you can easily throw God in there as the highest ideal, because he is the highest ideal in my belief. Um, he is the highest ideal, so so uh, so it is a religious idea. But take God out of it. Whatever your highest ideal is, is what you aim for consciously or unconsciously. So these stories point you toward a, an ideal, and it interests you. It compels you. It, these art, the, the, this music, this dance, these stories compel you because you see 
it, yourself in it, and you want to become that ideal. And that is a religious substructure of reality. Now that might point to God, and in some sense it most definitely does, but right. that isn't the same as the discussion about whether God exists right. as a, as a, from a propositional perspective. Which would be the wrong question anyway, I, I would argue. But, um, but yeah, so I, I was seeing all of this emerge from the research that I was conducting. And then at the time, I, was, I also read a book called Enchantment, mm. which was written by Guy Kawasaki, the former marketing director of Apple. Mm. And he defined enchantment as the process by which you delight someone, where a person sort of starts to open up to life, mm -hmm. life it's enticement, an enticement, mm -hmm. yeah. an invitation, and mm -hmm. an invitation, an attraction, so to speak. And um, he he said that this can be present in a human being, and a product, and an idea. And he also said that Steve Jobs used this idea to design Apple products uh, to to sort of figure out the the aesthetic of what mm -hmm. Apple products mm -hmm. should look like. And meanwhile, you know, the idea of enchantment correlates very closely with Disney because Disney is, you know, takes place in these enchanted forests and these magical kingdoms, and there's this underlying concept of enchantment. And so I just decided that enchantment seemed like the proper word to define this or to describe this phenomenon by which we start to open up to the complexity of ourselves mm -hmm. and thus to others. And, can, and, and which can give us a sense of a relational way of being as opposed to a consuming way of being, right? Eric Fromm, the philosopher, wrote a, a number of, of essays on the difference between having and being and how he talked about how in the West in particular, we have become caught up in this need to consume where we define our identity according to how much we possess, according to how much we have. Mm. Um, as opposed to our capacity to become wise, to be, right? Not to have, to be, to be wise, to be right, mature. And that should also be viewed with a tremendous amount of sympathy because it wasn't that long ago when we were all like Didn't struggling to yeah. feed hand to mouth <laughs> in know. the face of terrible privation and starvation. Yeah. It's that's very well so, said. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so that's another place to have some sympathy for hyper consuming human beings. It's like, oh, look, we. We have enough. Oh, well, that's never happened yeah. before, ever. So now we don't really know what to do with this. Yeah. And so so, true. See, and that's a reality of what's actually going on um, um, and uh, in, in our life today and why we're consumers. That's another point of view uh, and a good view with history uh, because it seems like people forget history so fast and Right now, we have people complaining about, well, almost creating their own issues because there's not problems. <laughs> this kind of secondary view of being a consumer and the reason behind it is is actually more broad-sided and, and closer to what the reality probably is than a lot of views of, of consumership. Um, that we, all, all our lives, our lives we've had enough, but we've been taught to consume. So that's not only a societal thing, that's not only a marketing thing, um, American consumership. It's also, we're not far from historically being starved um, and not having enough ever. Um, and, that's, and that's the reality of our history. So it's really interesting that he brings that up. Yeah, make sure to go check out Chloe Valdari and what she's doing with the theory of enchantment. Um, it, I think it's so cool. And I loved this conversation between her and Dr. Peterson. And yeah, I just love it. Thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you have any suggestions, drop them down in the comments. I would love to see what you guys are watching, what you're being informed by, and, and watching it, checking it out. Make sure to also go check out my Patreon. That's where you can help support this channel, grow to that next level. Link in the description below. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.